Okay, thank you and welcome to the, uh, the afternoon tutorial session. The first speaker is Tal Avgar, who's going to be talking about inferring sensory and memory capability. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay so... Um, my name is Tal and uh, I kind of have a, a history that relates to a lot of the history of, uh, of movement ecology around this room because I did my master's with uh, Ron Nathan. And I then uh, continue to do my PhD with John Fixell, and I'm now with Mark Lewis and Mark Boyce in uh, University of Edmonton. And what I'm going to talk about today is some uh, modeling approach that, that we tried to develop uh, during my PhD. And uh, if you're interested in, in the actual ecological application of this uh, work to real data with a more ecological perspective, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow afternoon. So today I'm going to talk about um, uh, inferring... Uh, cognitive capacities and specifically sensory and memory capacities based on telemetry data and environmental data and environmental information. And we're going to start with some uh, motivation and background. I'm, I'm sure many of you are, know this uh, citation from uh, Lima and Zollner that's kind of old now. We know remarkably little about the sorts of information available to animals at the scale of ecological landscapes. And we know even less about how such information is used in decisions regarding movement and patch or habitat selection. And I think it's quite remarkable, but this is very much true today. We still know very little about what animals know. And, and in, in the context of, of movement ecology and movement modeling, I think this is important because, for me at least, the uh, main objective is to predict animal space use patterns. That's, that's a lot of... Of, of the application we have, at least in wildlife <coughs> management. We want to be able to predict where will animals be and why they will be there. And, and well, maybe arguably, predicting requires mechanistic understanding of, of behavioral processes. Now, cognition underlies behavior. What the animal knows, how it makes its decision, are, are the drivers of what we see as behavioral patterns. And, and for me, this emphasizes the role of, of of at least taking account of perception and memory when we think about animal movement across landscapes. And <coughs> this is the almost last citation I'm going to give today. This is from a recent review by uh, Bill Fagan et al. at Ecology Letters about animal uh, movement and memory. Memory is one of many cognitive and information <coughs> use proce processes that might affect movement and navigation. However, differentiating between memory and other such processes is extremely challenging. And there exists a general need for a theoretical framework that can formally distangle the different cognitive and information processes that might influence movement. Now, what I'm going to present today is by no means a general theoretical framework, but it's an attempt to approach some of the problems or assumptions that we might make when we look at, at things like that. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the assumptions behind this model. I'm trying to explain to you how I constructed the algorithm. And what I want to encourage you to do is to ask me questions as I go. So I know that I'm not losing you and that nobody gets too bored. Um, and the, the question that I'm asking first is, is, how likely is an animal to appear in a given landscape location at a given time? So this, if we can answer this question, reliably, then we have a predictive model of space use. And, and the, the components that go into such a question is, first of all, the movement capacity or cost that the animal experiences. So uh, if we think about it in terms of the movement ecology framework, this is the, the basic ability of the animal to make a step. Its speed, its physical interaction with the landscape, permeability, factors like that. So this has nothing to do with the animal's preference or decision-making. This is a physiological or physical process. The next thing is, is local habitat components. So we know that animals adjust their movement to try and, and match resources in the landscape, resources such as food or to avoid predation. So we know, need to know something about local habitat components. And we need to know something about preference. And uh, preference has been, been dealt with mainly using resource selection functions. That's the overall term that people 
have given to how animals prioritize different aspects of their landscape in where they want to be and how they want to use space. And if we want to put this in, try and put this in mathematical terms, one way of, of putting that is, is describing the, the probability of occurrence in a given location at a given time. So J here is an index of location. And here, this could be in 2D or 3D. J is just an index. So those of you who are used to think about x, y, or i, j as indices of location, J incorporates both, even x, y, z. <laughs> so the probability of, of occurrence in a given location at a given time is governed by a non-cognitive relocation probability. This is the movement capacity part. This is the physical, physiological part that is not influenced by resources or habitat needs. And then there's a resource selection function. Uh, here I just sum over the preference for different habitat components multiplied by the perceived value of those habitat components in that location. So I is an index of habitat component here. For example, if we have predation and forage, predation would be I equal 1 and forage would be I equal 2. And, and we sum over all of those uh, interactions to model the animal's preference or avoidance of different features. Now, the, the key here, uh, I'll, I'll go back from it, the key here is this word, perceived. And this is what turns this modeling attempt, uh, that this is why I allow myself to put the word cognitive in there. Because what I'm interested in is what the animal actually knows about that location, not what I know from a satellite, which is what we do so far, right? Or from habitat mapping. What I'm interested in is what the animal knows. So how do we model what the animal knows? This is obviously a crude model of a cognitive process, a very crude model. But it's, it's the crude representation that I came up with to try and use observed telemetry data and landscape data to say something about what the animal knows. And, and what you see here are, are uh, three embedded circles where, where this is what the animal knows. Q is for quality, so the quality of habitat component I at location J at time T. And obviously the first component that needs to go into this is what the animal perceives. And, and perception is, is uh, done through the senses, either through vision, olfactory cues, hearing, whatever cues the animal uses from the environment, provide information about locations that is not the current location. So anything around it. And we need a model for that sensor information. And all of the models that I use here are very, very simple models. I use exponential models. So we have a, a, a term, an exponential term, that describes the rate of decay of sensor information with space and time. This is the actual real quality of habitat component I and location J at time T. And this exponential term here is a value between 0 and 1, right? It's a negative exponential. So it describes some fraction of this that the animal actually senses. And the assumptions here are that the further away that location is, the distance to J, the less the animal knows about it. Information decays exponentially with distance. This is true for sensor information and a lot of cases for olfactory information but accumulates with time. So delta t here is the, the period on which we observe the animal, our time step in terms of telemetry data. And what governs the rate of this process is the sensory attenuation coefficient, alpha. So an animal with a very high alpha, note the negative sign here, have very limited sensory capacity, right? It perceives only its proximate environment and not very far. An animal with a very low alpha perceives very far. If alpha goes to infinity, we have a blind animal. If alpha goes to zero, we have an omniscient animal. The second component is memorized information. Whatever the animal has perceived through its senses, it memorizes, it puts in its memory. But memory also decays. Memory decays as a function of time. And we know that from a lot of studies on a lot of organisms, 
And in many cases, an exponential decay actually captures that very well. So we have another assumption here that we have an exponential decay of memory with time that is governed by the memory decay coefficient, beta. So again, we have a value here that is between 0 and 1 and tells us how much of that memory exists. And this value is multiplied by whatever the animal perceived in the previous time step. That was the, the, the information that was committed to memory. And finally, to complement these two, sensory and memorized information, we have a default expectation. So whatever the animal never perceived, it has to assume something about it. This is kind of tricky, and we usually don't think about this much. But in any decision-making process, we have to, to complement the missing parts with something we assume. And this assumption could be anything. It could be something evolutionary programmed into the animal. It could be uh, just assuming the value of the current habitat where the animal is. It's just assuming that everything it doesn't know is that. It can be an average of everything it's experienced so far. I hope, I hope I'm not scaring anything. There is some math in this, in this uh, uh, presentation, but it's not, nothing scarier than this. <laughs> And, and this is, th this is the, the, what I call the cognitive algorithm. So this combines these three features that I just showed you into a single equation. This is a recursion equation. So it enables us to track the informational state of the animal from one point in time to the next over a trajectory. And what it does is, as we said, we have a term for sensory information, a number between 0 and 1 of how much information the animal perceived from a specific point in space and a specific point in time. And as I said, this is multiplied by the true value of what's really out there. Now, whatever the animal doesn't perceive, 1 minus that, <laughs> is complemented by its memory of previous experience. And again, this memory decays with time. So it's a number between 0 and 1. And whatever the animal doesn't remember is com complemented by its default assumption about the environment. So this, this equation here sums up to everything that the animal, animal knows about habitat quality i in location j at time t. And as I've already mentioned, this equation has three governing parameters. It has the sensory attenuation coefficient <laughs> that governs the sensory <coughs> process. It has a memory decay coefficient that governs the memory decay process. And it has a default expectation for the value of habitat component i at time t that is whatever complements these. And, and again, this, this parameter can be thought of, for example, if we think about it as something evolutionary programmed, if this parameter is higher than the average quality across the landscape, we can think of an optimistic animal versus a pessimistic animal, for example. So there's different ways of interpreting this. But overall, what this should give us is 100% of information, maybe not the precise information, but the information that the animal holds at that time. So how do we actually use this? Well, the way that we use this is using a redistribution kernel. Who here knows the term redistribution kernel? Multinomial? OK. Uh, discrete choice? They're more or less the same thing. So the, the idea is that, that we, we, can, we can actually have an explicit model of a probability of an animal occurring in a specific point in space and time. And, and that probability, this, this identity function here is just for truncation, because otherwise you can't <coughs> actually practically compute anything. So this is truncating the kernel at some maximal <coughs> distance. And in terms of actual telemetry data, that maximal distance can be, for example, the maximal distance that you've ever observed the animal displace. It can be twice that distance. It can be something that is drawn from a theoretical perspective. It's a, a, a choice of the user. And, and once we truncate the kernel, what, what we're actually truncating is a non-cognitive moving kernel. That is, what goes into this is the distance. That obviously determines the probability of relocating somewhere. The time that is available for relocating 
the time of year, day, season, whatever you choose, whatever is relevant to the biology of the animals. Some animals move at night, but not at day. Some animals move more in summer than winter. And a vector of parameters that govern this process. And I'm going to give a specific example in a second. And then we have the resource selection function, which, in which we put the perceived value of that habitat and the selection coefficient for that habitat. And we normalize the whole thing, so we actually have a kernel. We have probability. And the, the, uh, this is just an example. It's not just an example. It's the example that I used, more or less, in, when I fit this to real data. But this is just an example of explicit functions that we can use for these two kernels. So we have a non-cognitive movement kernel. Here we just have the speed of the animal is governed by a single parameter, theta. So the, the greater the speed that is required to get to a certain place in a specific time, the less likely that relocation is going to be. <laughs> and here we have the resource selection function. So this is actually identical to most resource selection functions applied, the exponential form, right? The exponent of the habitat quality times the resource selection coefficient. And again, we normalize this, and we get a specific truncated redistribution kernel that for a given point in space and time <coughs> gives us the probability of being anywhere else around that point. So these are the equations. These are the algorithms. So the, nothing too fancy, no differential equations. These are all recursion equations where we follow the informational state of the animal through a trajectory. And as I said, the redistribution kernel actually got different names by different people. We use it a lot in a lot of things. Uh, step selection functions can be considered the redistribution kernel in a way. Uh, discrete choice, multinomial. It's, it's a very useful uh, way of modeling animal movement and the reason that, or animal appearance, but, but the reason, one of the reasons that it's very useful is because it allows simulation, right? We can take that redistribution kernel, give it specific parameters, and now we can simulate a stochastic process across a landscape. Give me a raster grid, give me some parameter values, I apply this model, and we have a trajectory. And every time I will, move the, will run the simulation, if I let this be a stochastic process, I get a different realization of the same movement process. So just to show some examples of the model, that, a model similar to what I've just showed you, uh, over this <coughs> landscape where black is a good habitat, white is very low value of the habitat, so if we have an animal that is attracted to black, this is the assumption here, so the omega of this uh, environmental variable is positive and large. If we set alpha to infinity, as I said, we have a blind animal. The animal doesn't know anything about its environment. It can't adjust its location in the environment according to its information, and so it's doing a random walk. The same model exactly, the same structure of the model exactly, but with a different parameterization, here we have limited sensory capacity, so some finite value of alpha, and no memory capacity. The animal doesn't remember anything. We can see some matching of the trajectory on the black areas. And if you run a resource selection function on this, you'll actually find that there's a positive selection for black. But it's not exactly good matching. So this animal is not doing very well. Again, the same model, different parameterization. This time we set better to zero. I'm just giving you the extremes. This animal never forgets. The animal just stays in the same path. It moved around initially, sensed information, collected that information, and now relies on that information, and it just stays in the same path. Now this result doesn't have to occur when beta equals zero. It really depends on the landscape configuration, on other parameters, but we know from previous theoretical work <coughs> that the use of memory can give rise to home range behavior. Right? The establishment of stable home ranges. And, and what I want to um, show here is that you don't actually have to have, for example, like in uh, Van Muter's model, those of you are aware of that, uh, where they have two parameters governing the, the memory process, short-term memory and long-term memory. You can also get the same behavior with just one parameter. Again, depending on landscape configuration and other parameters. And finally, we have the omniscient animal, an animal where alpha equals zero, 
the animal perceives everything. It still has limited movement. It can't move anywhere it wants. The movement is still, in the absence of information, would still be a Brownian walk, or not a Brownian walk, but a random walk. But since it senses everything, it can make informed decisions along its road, and it eventually, in this case, arrives at the best path in the landscape and stays. So different parameter values can give us different animal behaviors in a simulation. And we can simulate whatever we want. Give me a landscape, give me parameters, we get some simulation. We repeat these simulations in a stochastic framework. We get a probability density of animals' distribution through space, their use of space, and so on. But when I, what I want to talk about today is, is the fact that the redistribution kernel doesn't actually give us, doesn't only give us the, uh, the ability to simulate movement, it also gives us the ability to parameterize models, and in this case, get the parameter values that I just talked about before based on likelihood. Because the redistribution kernel is a model of probability, and probability is the likelihood of the animal occurring in that location. So we, we can get likelihood based estimate of parameters. And this is done by basically taking the product of all occurrence probabilities along an observed trajectory. <coughs> so we have a trajectory, we have a parameter set that, that the redistribution kernels gives us the probability of the animal occurring in each one of the observed locations. If we multiply all those probabilities one by one, we get the likelihood. What we need for that is a landscape. We need habitat com components, and we need to decide on the spatial resolutions, and these are all important decisions. So whatever a habitat components you include or not include in this model, the accuracy of those habitat components, how much they reflect what is actually happening on the ground, is crucial here. The spatial resolution is also crucial here. By the way, that's true for almost every movement model, any model. We give the algorithm parameters parameter values, <coughs> the sensory decay coefficient, the memory decay coefficient, the default expectation, the parameters that govern the non-cognitive movement kernel, and the selection coefficients, whatever the animal prefers or avoids. <laughs> and then we can parameterize this. And, and one of the approaches of parameterizing this is using basis theorem. So uh, the likelihood of a model given the data is proportional to the product of the prior likelihood of the model and the likelihood of the data given the model. <coughs> so I'm reminding you that what we actually want is the likelihood of a model given the data. And what this gives us is the likelihood of the data given the model. So basis theorem allows us to shift from one to another under some assumptions, like for example that we need to use prior distribution. And, and to do that, to do this parameterization process, <coughs> this is basically a recipe. So if you could yeah, aim, your, you don't need to stand right here, but if you could aim your voice here a little bit more, then, we'll, then all of YouTube will, will be able to hear what you're saying a little bit better. Okay. So um, this is the recipe of what we need to parameterize such a model. And again, there's different versions of how you can code this how you define your landscape, how you define your parameters, and even how you define different kernels. The exponential forms that I showed you are just an example. There are many, many different functional forms that you can adopt and apply this. But first of all, we need an individual trajectory. So a time series of animal locations. We all know what that is. We're collecting them all the time, right? We have tons of them. We need a raster of each habitat component that we think that is important to the animal or that we want to ask questions about that encompass the entire observed trajectory with a generous buffer zone around it. Because we want to allow to calculate redistribution probabilities at the outskirts of the trajectory. We need initial values and restrictions for each of the three parameters. And finally, we need an optimization algorithm something to actually solve and give us the most likely parameter values. And there's different approaches to this. You can use a genetic algorithm. You could, you, you could use a simplex. You could use an MCMC, a Malgov Trey Monte Carlo, which is what I use, so that's what I'm going to talk about. But basically, many algorithms can be used to solve a problem like this. So the general idea is that we want to give the algorithm parameter values, get back a likelihood, 
do that many, many times and get the best parameter value. So, anybody here knows Metropolis Hastings? Good. So I'm gonna give a very brief overview of how we do MCMC, or at least how I do MCMC. <clears throat> this is something that I know that a lot of people are afraid of because it's A, Bayesian, and B, sometimes it, need, it requires actually writing your own code for, for optimization. I assure you it's not that complicated, the optimization. So don't be afraid of writing your own MCMC procedure. It's fairly straightforward. But you can also use WinBugs, of course. OK, so the first thing is to define priors and proposal distribution. The priors are the prior beliefs that we have about the parameters before we start this process, before we actually um, put them against real data. And, and again, I know that a lot of ecologists have problems with priors because they're informative. And that means that we're making assumptions before we even tested anything. And I'm gonna briefly talk about why I think sometimes this is actually useful and not just a nuisance. But we need to define prior distributions and we need to define a proposal distribution. In most MCMC applications, this would be just a normal distribution. So the proposal distribution is how far we go from the current value to sample the next value in the chain. If we have one parameter that we're trying to get at, we'll have a one-dimensional normal distribution. If we have five, we'll have five-dimensional normal distribution. We calculate the prior likelihood of the initial set of parameter values, right? We started with a specific value for alpha, for beta, <coughs> for the omegas. We calculate the prior likelihood based on our prior distribution. We calculate the conditional likelihood of this set based on the co cognitive redistribution kernel. So again, we, we look at the trajectory, we follow the, the information state of the animal from step to step. We calculate the probability of the animal occurring in each one of the locations along this trajectory and we get the likelihood of that data given the parameter set and, of course, the model structure. We multiply the two to get the posterior likelihood of a specific set of parameters. We randomly draw a new proposed set of parameter values from the vicinity of the previous set. This is where the proposal distribution comes in. Right? We have alpha equals 0.01, and if we have a normal distribution with a wide standard deviation, we might sample now alpha equals 0 0.03. And if it's tight, we might sample 0 0.011. But we get a new value for each one of the parameters. We repeat these two steps. So we get a prior likelihood and a conditional likelihood on the data. We calculate the posterior. And we compare these two posterior likelihoods previous one and the proposed one. If the proposed one is more likely, we accept it. We put it in the chain. If the proposed one is less likely, we take the ratio of these two, we randomly sample in proportion to that ratio, and then we decide whether to accept or reject. So obviously if the likelihood, if the proposed likelihood is very low, we're less likely to accept that value, and we repeat this again and again and again and again. Well, it's not us, it's the computer who's doing it. So depending on how complicated it is to get a single likelihood value, this might take anything between 10 seconds and 10 days to get a chain. And you need to decide on how long the chain is, and you need to decide on when, it con when you consider that chain converged. There's a lot of decisions to be made here. But eventually what we get is a posterior distribution of each parameter, or posterior distribution of all the parameters. And that is our likelihood-based estimate of each one of those parameters. So what, what I want you to get out of this is that we've, we've estimated all of these parameters simultaneously. The movement capacity, the sensory capacity, the memory capacity, the resource selection. We're not doing this in stages, like a lot of times in step selection functions. We'll first define the movement process, we'll sample out of the step length distribution and turn angle, and then estimate the resource selection function. Here we're doing this at one step. We're trying to evaluate the whole block because there might be very important um, covariation between those parameters.
affect each other. So we repeat this many, many times until we get a stationary chain of parameter estimates. And those are our estimate of the parameters. Questions? OK, so I promise to uh, talk briefly about why priors are not necessarily a nuisance. So as I said, a lot of people think that priors are not good because we're putting assumptions or expert opinion and biasing our, what we could get from the data. But priors can be useful in terms of limiting our parameters. So for example, for my sensor attenuation coefficient, a negative value wouldn't make sense. And they're also useful for representing null models. And obviously, the stronger we make the prior, the stronger we make the null model. And the more we demand out of our data to diverge away from that null model. So for example, for the memory decay coefficient, we can use uh, there isn't really an appropriate name for that prior, but we have a flat prior here, so the probability of getting any value along this range is the same. But then we have a, a higher probability of getting anything along this range, which is then set to zero, or anything at this range, which is then set to infinity. These are two null models, endless memory. There is no memory decay, or at least there is no information in our data to tell us that the animal ever forgets anything. And this is no memory at all. Or in other words, there is no information in our data to tell us that the animal rely on memory in its movement decisions. So this sets boundaries, but it also allows us to converge to something that tells us you don't have enough information to answer this question. And the same thing can be done for things like the resource selection coefficient. The resource selection coefficient can go to positive infinity or negative infinity, theoretically. Negative is repulsion. Positive is attraction, but we can say that our null model is indifference, <coughs> zero. So we can put the normal distribution around zero, or Laplacian distribution around zero. And if we don't have enough information to tell us that the animal is attracted or repelled by a certain habitat component that we put into the model, it will converge to zero. So this, in a sense, can be thought of as model testing, hypothesis testing. We use informative priors to represent our null hypothesis. And we want to see if our data actually diverges away from those null hypotheses. So these are the types of priors that, that I use when, when, when I uh, fit this model. And there's various ways of, of assessing such a model. Uh, in resource selection functions, often we use k fold validation to assess how good we do. A lot of times with, with weird models, plain R squares are just not good enough or, or not applicable. In this case, uh, what, and in a lot of other cases, what I propose to do is, is uh, to, to test the model using descriptive probes. So we take samples from the posterior distribution that we got out of this parameterization. Those samples reflect not only the likelihood estimate of the parameters, but also the, the uh, variance that we have around this. And we simulate. We said that the redistribution kernel can be used to simulate. So we simulate across the same landscape that we use to parameterize. This is the real landscape. We simulate trajectories. And now we can sample these trajectories and fit different descriptive probes. We can ask, what is the RSF? Using whatever method you'd like. We can ask, what is the step length distribution? How does the turn angle look? And we can ask how these distributions differ from what we see that the real animals are doing. So basically, we can, we can ask, could this model recreate the same patterns that we see in real data? And this is just in a, a theoretical example where we did this with simulated data. So we simulated data with the model. We fitted the model at different temporal resolutions. So this is subsampling the trajectories in different spatial resolutions. This is subsampling space, <laughs> the, the resolution of your grid. And then we re-simulated across those landscapes. And we asked, how is the solid line, which is the actual values that you get 
fit with the dotted line, which is the values that we get from our simulation based on the posterior distributions. And in this case, the, the variable in the, in the descriptive probe is the RSF. It's the selection for a specific landscape layer or a specific landscape habitat. And, and again, I can't compare this to other methods because this is rarely done with, with other methods, testing the sensitivity to scale. But across most scales, we see a pretty good fit between the descriptive probes that the simulation can generate and the descriptive probes that arise from that process originally. So this is encouraging in the sense that this can capture the behavior pattern of the animal across scales, both in space and time. And again, this can be easily done with real data. Once you fit this to real data, you can do the same exercise with real data and assess what you actually get in terms of predictive power from this model. So obviously, this approach has a lot of uh, problems. It's computationally and informationally demanding. You need to get a lot of landscape data, good landscape data. And you need to invest some in good codes and maybe good computers. The inference is sensitive to unobserved locations and misclassified landscape attributes. This is true for many analysis that we do in animal movement, in animal spaces. Um, it's, it's very true here. So you, you should always take your inference with a grain of salt, thinking about, OK, if I have an unobserved location, the animal has been here, but I don't have it in my trajectory. And that informs my sensory capacity, for example. I will overestimate the sensory capacity of the animal. And memory must be initiated. Because when we run this, we need to say something about what the animal remembers when we started the, the trajectory. And what that requires in terms of real data, of empirical data, is long trajectories. So if you think that the animal probably remembers something at the scale of years, then you need several years of data to actually tell you something about when that memory decays. And that's a serious limitation, and that would be a limitation that exists anywhere when you want to infer memory based on observed data in the wild. So I want to finish this with, with, with uh, another and last quote from Tegan et al. Cognitive processes such as sensory perception and memory are fundamental to the behavioral environment interface. Full understanding of how cognitive processes are influenced by and give rise to movement patterns will require better remote sensing data of the environment <coughs> animals move in to complement tracking data. Novel perspectives on data analysis and new approaches for mathematical and computational modeling. So basically what I want to say is that we're not there yet. I'm not there yet. I want to be there. I want to have the right movement data and the right landscape data to actually be able to answer these questions. But we're not there yet, but maybe inching towards. And I'm going to finish with a scary cognitive algorithm, algorithm equations and take any questions. No, it only allows for imprecise memory through the process of decay. So it doesn't allow for uh, the animal perceiving one thing when there's another there because of errors in perception, as you say, so uh, problems in signal processing and things like that. That doesn't, is not incorporated here. Yes? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The question, the question was uh, whether the equation uh, or whether the algorithm allows for um, misclassification errors in the, in, the, in the sensory process of the animal, which is something that probably happens. We look at something and we think it's red and it's actually green. Not, not because of sensory errors, just, just because of memory decay. That's the only thing that's incorporated. Yes? And for the movement part, you just repeat the yes. So the question was about the, the 
movement process, the non-cognitive movement process, and that, that, how that's incorporated. And that's, I mean, in the, in the example that I showed here, it's just a very simple exponential decay. I'll get there eventually. So it's this part here, right? There's no habitat components here. This is just an exponential decay of the probability of relocating with distance. That increases with time. If you want this brown in, it can be Gaussian. If you want this with directional persistence, add directional persistence, but it allows separating the, the physiological and physical part of the movement process from the part of choosing where you want to be based on what's there. Can you choose a random direction? In, in this case, the direction is random, yes. And, and it's a jump? It's, not a, it's, it's a jumping walk, process. It's a jumping process, and that's one of the problems with missing observations. Okay. If you want to minimize that problem, you want a grid as fine as possible and movement data as fine as possible so that most of your moves are nearest neighbor moves, right? The animal mostly moves from one cell to its nearest neighbor, and then you're not missing a lot in the middle. Yes? The, the, so the function is... Are you at x or at each inch at each time uh, step you are uh, recomputing? No, at, we, you, you recompute at each step. So re, the redistribution kernel is recalculated each position. There's two things that we update. We update the informational state, and we update, we take that informational state, we plug it into the redistribution kernel, and we recalculate the redistribution kernel. So we can get different redistribution kernels for different locations, along the trajectory, based on what are the habitat components and what the animal knows about them. And also, if you have time variable non-cognitive movement, based on that. So this is recalculated for each position. And also based on the animal's nutritional state, as it changes as it gains resources. So I don't have that incorporated yet. But obviously, if you have other sensors on the animal, you can say, OK, now I have the probability of moving based on its stomach content, or based on its heart rate, or based on its temperature. Yes? Yes? Yeah, I mean, similarly, how does this work when you have different behavioral states? So the animal goes from the dense side, it goes foraging, makes a decision based on that, and then the human behavior is just directional to some place. How does the step work? So again, this is not incorporated here. So when you run something like this, the assumption is that there are no different behavioral states. Right? This, the assumption here is the animal always is in the same mode, day, night, foraging, non-foraging. <clears throat> but it's very easy to incorporate. Because what you need to do is to incorporate the time effect either on the movement, on the resource selection, or both. You can have a behavioral state where the animal moves more in one state and less in another, and that's not because of resources. That would be incorporated in the non-cognitive part. If you have a behavioral state that affects the resource selection function, the animal prefers to be in refuge one time of the day and foraging habitat in another. That affects this part. So you will need external data to do that or get this very complicated in terms of adding another state, state space dimension to it. Yes? No, you don't have to do that. No, you can, you can incorporate dynamic domains. So when we run this, I'm going to talk tomorrow about fitting this to caribou data. And we have uh, temporal components to the landscape layers. I mean, based on what we can get. So some of them are seasonal. Some of them are daily, like snow depth. So you can incorporate, uh, for example, if you think that snow, snow depth slows down the animal, you can incorporate your snow depth here. And it can be temporally dynamic because you recalculate this at each step. That, again, base is, is dependent on your assumptions. So you can assume that the animal remembers where it depleted, or you can assume that the animal remembers the value before it arrived there. 
you can interpret that as remembering the carrying capacity versus the given up density. It depends on the modeler's assumption on what kind of test you want to you want to test. Yes. Yes. Yes, the question was about incorporating different time periods. And yes, this because again, because the, the redistribution kernel and the informational state are calculated at each step, any temporal dynamics can be incorporated, either in the landscape or in the physiological or behavioral state of the animal. So it just depends on how complicated you want to get. Uh, yes. Should I run away now? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes. Depending on, on the quality and the, of the data and how much it actually tells us and how much of the model is actually valid, there is problem with, with too strong collinearities in the parameters. So because these parameters, I mean, if you think about these three parameters, they all inform just what the animal knows about a specific location and specific time. So they obviously vary and 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 that creates ridges in the likelihood and that is a problem and so again that's something to consider when you when you choose your optimization algorithm of something that is actually can cope with some ridges in the likelihood surface but to be more specific what I found most problematic with the data that I worked with is this guy here because what happens is that if this guy goes high, and this is something that the animal is attracted to, this promotes mo movement. Because we have limited sensory capacity, so the animal knows a lot about what's near, but very little about what's far. It knows little about what's far, so it relies on this. And if this is high, it moves there. So we're getting this weird, I wouldn't call it side effect, but it's a phenomenon where if the animal assumes that Whatever he doesn't know is better, it moves a lot. And obviously the other way around. So the way I worked around this when I fitted to real data in, in the case that I'm going to talk about tomorrow is just by fixing this and, say, and making the assumption that this is what the animal currently experiences. So whatever the animal assumes, because it doesn't perceive it and it never visited it and it can't remember it, it assumes that it has the same value as where it is now. And obviously different assumptions can be made here. Yes, Ronald. So, uh, resolution data works best, so each step is relatively close. Um, so you can have an, I'm curious if your model can deal with the case where an animal might move to a place that it doesn't want to go because it has a goal of getting to some place that it remembers very far away that's maybe 15 steps forward. So the, the question was about uh, longer steps where the animal actually navigates to a place <clears throat> that is further away. And the short answer is this, this model is a complete failure in, in dealing with such situations. So the assumption of this model is that the process is, is, is a very, uh, uh, is the movement process is governed by very local conditions. And, and uh, it is actually extremely difficult, modeling-wise, to, well, it's difficult in the sense that you have to make a lot, a lot of assumptions to incorporate goal-oriented movement, long-distance long goal-oriented movement in these kind of processes, because then you have to account for two things, what the animal decides at each step, and where is it going to? So it actually requires maybe two models like that acting simultaneously at two different scales. And in, yes, it gets nasty. You can't model that because that's a traveling salesman problem. You can only do it by simulation. First of all, these are all simulations. So there's no, there's no real solution to any of these. <clears throat> yes, it is a traveling salesman problem. But you can, for example, if you have a model of of how different targets in the landscape change their value over time. And you have a function that describes, so you can think about applying this. 
this at two different scales, at the scale of the whole landscape that is available, that is stored in the animal memory, and this is how it's making its decision about long-term processes, and at the scale of the local habitat. And the same for the redistribution kernel. But again, it, it makes for a lot of assumptions and a lot, a lot of parameters. So if I understand you correctly, the question is about this. If, if, we, if we give this a, a distribution. Exactly. Yes, I mean, in what I've done so far, I've given this a temporally dynamic value. So it changes from step to step based on what the animal is. But you can, you can give it a distribution, because, but it's saying, not. You were saying that this, 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 this makes the animal move far, you know, move faster, you know, these biases with these parameters. Yeah. Yes, but I think uh, the, the previous question about moving to far away targets, it, well, at least in my mind, would refer to places where the animal knows something about and hence is navigating towards because now it wants to return to that excellent tree over there. And, and so, so that has to be incorporated in both the cognitive part of the model and in decision-making part. So it, we, need, we need somehow to weigh what the animal makes in the short term and in the longer term. Appreciate it. You seem to have generated a lot of questions. Thank you.